Okay, thanks for coming and um, being here. Okay, this tutorial about getting started with OOP with uh, signal processing, which is a typical different domain. My name is Francesco Bruni, came from Italy. This is my first time at PyCon US and first time in America as well. Um, it's such a big honor that you stay here and choose this tutorial among all other, maybe much more interesting tutorial that month. Um, just a few words about this crash course, a few words about me. I'm a senior software engineer in a company that is called Planetech Italia in the southern part of Italy. We play with Earth observation, so we play with um, extracting data from satellite imagery, running algorithms capable of running on top of uh, uh, microsatellites just to look at the Earth. I'm playing with Python for 15 years, but still, I repeat myself as uh, uh, intermediate level, not very really expert. Um, I'm not single tech fanatic. I typically use multiple technology in my daily routine, so I'm pretty comfortable working, for example, with Java. And we are going to see some difference between Python and Java, for example, just to make uh, clear that I'm um, not a fanatic about the technology. I typically use the technology to solve a particular issue. Okay. Um, just a few words about my town. Town in Italy are very different from town in America, I notice. I always looked in the films, but in the reality, it's much more different. Uh, Bari is located in the southern part of Italy, around the sea. It's pretty known for sea and gastronomical, but my personal point about this is the metropolitan area of Bari is really interesting if you, uh, let's say, have some curiosity about the aerospace sector. In fact, there are multiple companies that play with this kind of stuff, like designing and implementing electronic for running satellite as well as software that runs on top of a satellite. So this place in uh, the southern part of Italy is very active in this sector. Um, before beginning, my personal opinion on why we still need to talk about object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming is very old topic. Okay, so everyone is talking and talked a lot about, um, about object-oriented programming. My question is, why we still need to talk about object-oriented programming in the era of artificial intelligence, Web3, blockchain, deep learning, whatever. Just put any buzzword you want. The main issue is that if you understand the guidelines, the main principle of object-oriented programming, which is uh, somehow narrow to a little small domain, which deals with computer, you can try to translate this concept, this idea, to something that is much more challenging, like, for example, software architecture. So you, if you find yourself in a way to design systems, to design, for example, microservices architecture, you can find that much more of the principle that we're going to see during this crash course can be translated to the microservice architecture as well. And we're going to see samples in a while. Um, from my point of view, I always, and I say always, uh, played with, uh, learned, and played with object-oriented programming through two different things, animals and other rooms. I was very tired of trying to explain, and trying to study all this really important stuff with two such, let's say, boring topic like other rooms or mammals, humans. So I asked myself, what exactly can be, let's say, um, sort of crash course that try to explain object-oriented programming and gets you to get acquainted with some domain that you probably don't know, but it is somehow overwhelming all of us, which is signal processing, like this one. And by the way, I turned a computer sciences. I got a, uh, I got a degree, a master's degree in telecommunication engineering, so I pretty really changed to this topic, okay, which I really love a lot. You know that signals are basically analog and digital. We play with digital, obviously, because we play with computer. Even if we are going to tell a few stories about the amplitude modulation, which is applied to analog signal at the, uh, during this crash course. But this is our topic. So a few words about this crash course. You are not expected to know anything about signal processing, obviously, okay? because this course is much more about they say object-oriented programming, but the domain is signal processing. So I cannot assume, obviously, that you know something about. But if you know, that's good. We're going, obviously, just to scratch the surface of signal processing, okay? So we are not going deeper. There would be a live coding. For this, I ask them, and I thank you, uh, to put a table over here because I need to code 
with you. You can just copy what you write, understand, make questions, or you can just download all the code from my website. So that's totally up to you. Will be for different exercise break at the end. If you feel lazy, you can just look at the solution I upload it on the website. You know that Python is required. We are Python conference. But if you want to, let's say, a more in-depth experience with signal and wave, not with object, with signals and waves, I strongly suggest you to use Jupyter because you probably are going to listen, visualize signals as well. And obviously, all the complexity has been wrapped in the, not the UTC, in the classes module. Uh, because you are not required to know anything about signal processing. So I just take with some implemented function all the things that you actually need to play with this code. Okay, the only piece of theory about signal processing that you need is just this concept. The difference between signal and wave. A signal is nothing else than a mathematical formulation of something. When you play, for example, a note of a piano, like a C, open C, what you have is that you basically can constrain that sound to that formula, where the T, the independent variable, is the time, okay? The A is the amplitude, which is in turn is related to the power of the signal, and then to the volume. So you can consider that scaling up down the value of the A, which is basically a constant, you can increase and down the volume of the note of the piano. So it's pretty easy to be understood what exactly is A. The F is the frequency of the signal or the wave. Uh, higher F means a more acute sound, while a, a lower F means a more grave sound. And the phi, which is the last term, is the delay. So if you want that your sound starts, I don't know, maybe uh, phi, 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 by two, delay, phi by two radians, okay, you just change the value. But in our, let's say, in our example, we can consider that theta is capable of to be zero. Uh, when you compute this uh, formula for different distances of time, you get the, the diagram on your right, which is called the wave. So signal is just a nice way to, uh, let's say, to express something mathematically. Okay, and the wave on the left, the wave on the right is what exactly your ear is capable to feeling. The main problem is that when you play, for example, with music, the signal formulation is impossible, okay, because the sound is not very easy. I, I, I forgot to mention that that sin is a mathematical function, which is periodic, so it comes after a period from the beginning, again, 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 again. And for this reason, you got the wave on the right when you compute that formula for different time or different instances of t. Um, sometimes, you could ask, uh, it could work obviously with signals and wave in a different domain. We typically do the different domain. And this domain can be called, for example, a frequency domain. So instead of visualizing the time and the uh, power, yeah, sorry, the, the time and the value of that function in the previous slide, you can obviously perform some plot like this, where you plot on the, y, on the x axis the frequency, and on the y axis you plot the power itself. This is very cool representation because this lets you to understand what exactly is going to happen in terms of frequency itself. And uh, if you play, for example, because I'm pretty sure that you play web, you play an equalizer, for example, you increase the power of certain range of uh, frequency. It's much uh, simpler to understand the role and how the equalizer works if you look at the wave in the frequency domain, not in the time domain. Uh, by the way, you can switch from time domain as we in uh, um, frequency domain, just switching from wave to spectrum, then after the spectrum, you can apply some sort of filtering in order to, I don't know, low pass filtering to reduce all the voices from a song, for example, and then get back to the wave itself, which is basically the main uh, interface that you hear is going to fill. With this introduction, we are ready to code. Do you have a question about all this part? Perfect. Okay, um, sorry, sorry. Can I wear off the mask? No, can I, can I remove the mask while talking? Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. So 
I just forgot the first part for now. Okay, so our main issue is um, that we basically need to explain to a computer how exactly a uh, signal on a web should be treated. Okay, so we need to find a way to explain all these things, all the complexity of this world to the, uh, to the computer itself. And uh, um, I think it's very um, common to use the concept of objects and the concept of class to express all the, all the Ah, okay. Let's go. Okay. So that's probably nice to introduce the concept of uh, object, object and the concept of class. So we stick with the first definition. A class is a data type. So if you have, for example, an integer, a string, or a float, okay, they are all data types. A class itself is a data type. So we need to find some sort of way to define this data type and put all the logic inside. So in order to do this, what we can do is using the keyword class, define, for example, the class itself, like the signal. Okay, um, the main two pointers of a class are basically two different things, attributes and methods. Attributes are the uh, interesting characteristics of that object, of that class. So, for example, if you think about a human, human has two different eyes, but the color of the eyes is an interesting characteristic. So, you can define, obviously, this attribute inside the definition of the class. And the other thing is the methods. So, they are basically actions you can perform on that kind of class, or that kind of object. So, if you uh, talking about signal a wave, for example, an action that you perform a wave is listening to the wave or just looking at the plot domain of the wave in the time domain or in the frequency domain. So the first thing that we are going to do so is defining the attributes. We just saw that three main attributes are required to um, being defined in the signal. The first one is the amplitude, okay. Second one is the frequency. And the third one is the offset. Okay, for now, let's just forget about the periodic function that's in, okay? We try to tackle it uh, maybe later on. Okay, um, those are the attributes. Mm, the main point is that the this kind of declaration is abstract, okay? It does not exist. You are just saying that the signal is composed by amplitude, frequency, offset, but it does not exist because you just say that, okay, man, this is composed by these, these three different fields. So what you need to do is creating an object. So an object is an instance of the class, while the class is just the declaration of a particular object. So consider an object like a, some sort of template, while the object is the uh, existing concretization of the template. Um, in order to, let's say, set up and uh, set up the initial value of the object itself, we need a special method, so a special action. An action that the Python is called init. So we can define, for example, the init method, okay, and try to write the implementation of RIA. First of all, the self, okay, is the instance itself. You will understand it in a while, but think about it. This is a method that works on instances. So this is a method that works on the concretization of the signal itself. So the first, the first element should be the object itself, the implementation itself. Um, like any other method, you can obviously provide some parameters. And we are going to provide, for example, the amplitude, the frequency, and the offset. OK, that's good. And our implementation will be pretty easy because right now what we need to do is set up attributes of the instance itself within this method to set up the amplitude, to set up the frequency, frequency, and set up the offset. Okay. So I just can remove this one because it does no sense. You can obviously provide some default value, like for example, the offset is zero or I don't know, maybe the amplitude is one. And once you define the template of your object, so the template, you define the class itself, we need to create it. So how can you create it? Just calling the class itself, signal, open up parentheses, set the up, for example, amplitude 1.0. Sorry, this is a float. Mm, let's put, for example, a default frequency, okay. Mm, 
600 and offset zero. Okay, so if we run this code, what I get is an instance of the signal itself. Um, obviously, you can avoid to setting up all these parameters because we provided some default value for this one, or you can just pass, for example, only the amplitude because you want, for example, a louder sound and set up the, the and let the constructor set up the, um, the other fields like frequency and offset. So it is basically the same. We still got a signal, but the signal is an object that is different from the first one. Um, we just so we just say that okay the attributes are the first part of a signal so we need to identify this uh, kind of object using attributes but still we need to define actions that we can perform over this uh, of the instance once the instances of this has been created so we can for example define a new function that is called print period or oh, period is just the inverse of the frequency and for example this one is just going to print for example at the uh, period is dot f, okay, which is basically south dot frequency. Oh, sorry. Okay. That's okay. So we added an action over this class. So we try to call it to see if it works. So if I call, for example, the print period, okay. Oh, sorry. Just forgot this one. Okay. So, for example, you get this one. So, we added the period over here. Mm, okay, that's good. You got any questions till now? Perfect. Way much simpler. Okay. Um, we just saw the introduction that uh, what we are going to use is not exactly the signal, it's actually the wave. Okay, our concretization of the signal in a way that we can just listen it. Okay, so we define, for example, another method that is, that is called create wave. Okay, first argument is obviously the instance itself. Self. And we need to create wave here. In order to create the wave here, we need to set up few arguments to the create wave. First of all, the duration. Okay, like for example, let's consider a duration by default by two seconds. And the other one is the frame rate. Frame rate, okay that we could set up to, let me see, three cup, okay, 3,000, okay. So for now, we just define a new function, okay, with some default value, nothing complex, good. Um, obviously, you don't need to know and remember the formula that we just saw, so if you go from helpers, import, create wave samples, let me see, yeah, perfect, create wave samples, uh, you can get the uh, wave representation of this signal. So if I go create create wave samples over here, okay, you can get the duration is the first argument, okay, frame rate, frame rate, frequency is the self dot frequency, okay, amplitude is self dot amplitude phase is zero, that's okay, and the periodic function can be set. Okay, that's good. So this function is going to return me something like the TS, yeah, YS, sorry, YS and TS. Okay, that's fine. And I can obviously set up two different fields, self dot TS, okay. And return YS, okay. So what we did, we just call a function defining the helpers module the module that I made you download from the website and I sent you via the introduction markdown file. We call this method create wave sample that takes different kind of arguments. It's not very relevant right now to know what exactly they are, but if you're free, we can obviously talk later. This is going to return YS and TS. YS and TS are basically the uh, Y value and the X value of the wave representation of the signal. So if you go back, for example, the implementation, the, this one, the YS is the, the, the value of the amplitude itself, while the uh, um, TS is the time. So TS stands for time instances, while YS is the value on top of the uh, Y axis. Uh, and we can obviously add a new kind of um, new kind of attribute, which is YS. So I decided to 
once I get the YS array, which is basically an array of points, I try to set up as a new attribute, okay, that's YS, and the same so for TS. So if I go over here, for example, and I call, instead of printing period, I call the create wave, okay, what do you have is this one. Oh, obviously, you got this one, this is an array, uh, because so basically the, I'm, returning the, I'm returning the YS. So, for example, if I define another method that is called plot, okay, first argument is always a self, this is going to return the plot, sorry, return plot self YS from zero to 100, self dot TS, so zero to 100, oh sorry. First argument is the yx, okay, it's the x, okay. This one, and I can import plot from here. So if I run it again, yeah. Uh, so the create wave function is not imported properly, so what do we No, create, no, create wave function is defined by me, so it cannot be imported. That's created by Yeah, that was created by me. No, the, okay. What is important is the create wave samples function. This is important. Yeah, from helpers. Because you probably are missing the helpers module. Yeah, let me see. Uh, the one that you download from the website. Let's go, let me see. So I cannot find that one because I'm missing helpers. Because, uh, but did you upload the uppers file? That's all, that's the issue. Okay. Oh, before using, I just remember for all of you, uh, before using all this file and the library that I provided to you, you need to upload them first in the Jupyter. And then, lots in Jupyter using the percent lots instruction, like I point out in the description, and then you import it, okay? If you not, no, not following all these things, you can use the upper file. Everyone has the same issue, I'm going to repeat it. Okay, so everyone is working in scope? I didn't get the mail to you guys, but it took a long time. But did you sign up? Yeah. It's very strange. Oh, by the way, go to, open up your browser. Uh, this one. This one, just download the helpers file from here. Okay, you upload then a new lot, okay. Okay, I try to refresh again, just to be sure that everyone is on track. Uh, what you need to do is when you go over here, you click for example on the, this is uh, called up Google, okay, but it's basically the same if you are running a local instance of the Jupyter. You need to click on, on click to the upload, you need to select the file, like the helpers or the classes, that's another file that I provided to you in the website, but not in the getting started introduction the material that I sent. And when you do this, you can just, um, you can just write something like load helpers, okay, and then run the import. And when you do this way, basically the Python module, look at the system path of Python has been updated to include also this module and then the function. Um, okay, so we were playing with this one. Okay, so once we create the wave, we can call obviously the plot function, okay? And the plot function, oh sorry. Let me see, oh, sorry. Okay, here you find the here you find the plot representation of our wave uh, wave samples. So what we did so far is basically define the signal, define functions, define attributes. What exactly are the attributes that are going to 
identify almost uniquely our, our uh, concretization of the signal. Okay, and then we add two different methods. Okay, create wave and maybe the plot in order to create wave samples, thus creating the array of values in terms of time, in terms of amplitude for the waves and then plot them. Um, let's try to update the print period function in order to print something else. Okay, like for example, let's print the ys size. Okay. Sub.ys. Okay. Okay. So if I'm going to plot the print period, okay, that's why. So I just updated the print period function in order to print the size of the array the ys. The size of the array is 6,000. That's good. But with this kind of implementation, there is a problem. And the main problem is that the print period function won't work if I not created the wave first. So if I try to, for example, maybe, uh, yeah, command this one, try again. Oh, it's saying that signal object has not YS. That's totally normal. Because we basically have, have committed some errors. Mixing up the concept of wave with, uh, with signals itself into the same class and make the methods depends and work on two different kind of pieces of the domain. The signal from one side and the, um, and the wave and the wave from the other side. So this is very the, uh, maybe the issue. Okay, this first part completes the get stuck introduction to object oriented programming. Now, what you basically um, can do is picking up the, if you want obviously, picking up the exercises, okay, like this one, okay, which is uh, the file I loaded into the, my website, qsus.com, okay, download it, and you try to solve, for example, the exercise one. If you feel lazy, absolutely, do not worry about it, because they probably the solution file that you can find on the website that show you the solution. Let's just see the, simply the, the, the problem you're trying to solve. Obviously, we forgot to add the periodic function to definition of our signal. Yeah. Is this located in your website? Yeah, always the same website, exercise PDF file. Exercise PDF. Ah, sorry. Yes, that was the beginning, sorry. Okay, let me see. Website is this one. Website this one. Mm -hmm. This is website. Ah, I just scrolled down to the conference page. I just, okay. I make them notice at the beginning of this talk. You go under the conference page. Okay, just go upper, go upper, 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 upper. There's one. Click on this one. Yeah. Click on that one. Yes, exactly. And this is all the material you basically are going to are going to need throughout this course. Okay? Yes, that was my my fault. Okay. I just said at the beginning of this talk. So once you download the exercise PDF, you basically are going to um, see four different kind of exercise. One for each per each module. Okay, we are going to use four different modules to explain these things about object-oriented programming. And the first exercise would be would be about, just one moment. Okay, would be about changing the definition of our signal, because if you remember well, we forgot to add another piece of the signal, which was the periodic function, okay? So you need to try a way to add that param to the, to the constructor itself in order to update our signal definition to include this new thing. And uh, we saw that we mixed up signal and waves together. We saw the issue of the print period function. So what you need to do is trying to apply the same logic to the final wave class, okay? They should be uh, basically two different things, ys and ts, the, the time instances and the amplitude, say, uh, the amplitude uh, values. Those are list. Do not consider the uh, numpy and the array. Just consider them list, okay? And you obviously need to refactor print stats method in order to overcome the issue. Uh, once you're done, once you're done, 
you can download the other file, which you can find on the website, classes, which, is, uh, which contain the implementation of the new version of the signal. And so we are going to use that kind of definition to get to the rest of the course itself. Okay. In general, on the classes file, you can find other definition of classes that we are going to use throughout the whole course. So there's no need to write again and again and again. That's all. You, know, you got uh, 15 minutes. Oh, by the way, I'm here. So if you want any question, you ask me. Yeah. Let me put the mask on. Oh, because there's no need to open up this file. Okay, look. Okay. Okay, let me see one thing. This one is useless. Okay, so what you need to do is load helpers like this way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ah, okay. Perfect. So. Okay, because you need to install my plot lib and uh, okay. Go here, type no, no, no type problem. You, you can install just over here. Just like this. Be Sorry, your keyboard is different than mine. Pip install. I'm using uh, pip3. Um, I think it's the same. Matplotlib, no, pi. Oops. Okay. Okay, is it installing? Okay, now you execute this one. Your model matplotlib. So the helper's pi file is located in the same directory as this uh, no, but, Jupyter. Um, this is very odd. Because we just installed matplotlib here. I don't know exactly what is happening because not, we actually. I'd, I'd rather not use uh, Jupyter Notebook and just uh, do regular regular uh, import on the Python file. I think that should. But did you do something that I'm I'm missing now? Oh, this is fine. The file number is here, so it seems correct to me. But you have this strange issue, but no model name at plot loop. Give me one sec. But you're not, but you're not using the uh, virtual environment? No. Uh, this no. probably be the, the issue. It's a global install. Um, I, I can create a virtual environment and run it there locally. But I haven't had plot loop on the global installation. I don't know. Can you Here, I'll, I'll get oh, can, you use, can you use the Google Colab? Can we try using a Google Colab? Uh, the what? Google Calendar? Go, no. Colab. This one. This one is a very nice way to use Jupyter. Not probably done installing all the files, okay? You got a Gmail account? Yeah. Okay. So, okay, we try this way. Someone related to the the environment. I don't know. Basically the same, huh? Yeah. You normally use. Uh, I typically use this one because this one lets me to not install all the faster type. Basically, yeah. so you go over here. Yeah. You disconnect. Yeah. One yeah. moment. Yeah. Once connect, you upload the file here. Okay. So where you have the. 
that bars, that bars, that bars, this one. Open up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We install again. We, we install matplotlib numpy. Okay. Load helpers. Okay. From helpers import all. Sorry, uh, right, create web samples, just to be sure that it's good. Yeah, that's all. We suggest you. Just, uh, just put enter. Okay. Which one is the shortcut to run? Shift, enter. Shift, enter. Okay, that's perfect. Okay, now copy and paste the code. You just use this. Because you probably you messed up something with the global installation. Oh, this is a very, my personal point, eh? do not take it as an offense. It's very bad practice to not use Python virtual lamp. Okay? Because otherwise you're going to mess up all the things in the operative system. So, if you want to play Python locally, use the virtual lamp. You got issues? Uh, no, I didn't understand what you were asking us to do. So. As exercise, do you want me to rephrase the exercise? No, no. If you want a problem, open up the exercise. One moment. Okay, so when we define the signal, the signal class, okay, we uh, forgot to add the periodic function attribute, okay? But periodic function is a very important piece of a signal definition because it defines how the, sig how the signal the waveform, okay? So you need to change the implementation of the signal wave class in order to add this periodic function as well as adding and defining a new class for mapping the wave. Because in this case, look, well, you just look at the solution because in this wave, the create wave samples, the create wave method that I coded, okay, was returning the array, was returning the list of values. But you need to return an object, an instance of the wave class that you need to define. That's exercise. Is that clear? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You just need to define a new wave class. Now, this is useless for you. You just need to define. You just need to define a new wave class as we did for signals. But instead of containing attributes for signals, it should contain attributes for waves. Yeah, that because uh, yeah, because I'm trying to stick with the mandatory mandatory break. She had a small question. Yeah, okay, sure. You got a question for me? Um, so I can't find the. Uh, yeah, because you didn't upload. Maybe go over here. Uh, that's the upload. No, 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 you don't care about this. Sorry, let me close this one. Close. Go over here and load this one. Helpers. Yeah, that's. Ah, okay. This one. So but once you did this, so. Oh, yeah, okay. Good. So we just need to load helpers file. Load helpers dot pi. Okay, that's good. You know why? Because you you are in the wrong directory. Yeah, I couldn't find. Let the me directory. see. PWD, oh. you're, here. you're in the content, you're over here, no? So we can move okay. helpers.pi on the, oh sorry, the layout is different, content, okay. And oh, so it looks like show. Mm -mm -mm. This one. There you go. Okay. Lot. Uh, oof. Okay. Alpers. Yeah. Are you fine? Okay. That's fine. Remember to work always in the content and on the end of the day. So move. Just move. Do the same with classes. Or you can upload directly into the content and not in the root, right. for, in the root partition. 
Okay. You got issues? Perfect. Did you solve the exercise? You're trying to. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely, that's fine. But at least write it. Huh? Okay. Please don't think this is the simplest part ever of the crash course. Huh? Exactly, exactly, yeah. You probably miss the introductionary part where it's, ah, oh, okay, 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 that's clear now. So you can just download the, the introductionary slide from the website in order to get understood what exactly has signals and a wave is. Okay. Sorry, did not understand. There's an exercise to recapture print stats. Exactly, excellent. Oh, print stats is the method that is capable of printing the period of a function as well as the size. No, no, it's a print stats because it's not printing just the period. It's printing two different things like I show in the, the, in the tutorial because it's printing the size of the array as well as the period. So you need to refine it because basically the size of the array belongs to the wave class on the signal. Yes. We need to make a new print stats. Okay. Period and some other Okay. Right? Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Print stats doesn't exist. So no, okay. So we can't really mm. factor. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. That's correct. So um, as your friend here is noticing, I did not implement the print period function in our my implementation of the signal. I implemented a method that is called a plain stats, which is much more generic. So you need to adapt that method and call it print period. Or you can change the implementation of the print stats. It's basically, it's basically the same. Received the instruction when registering to the form? I did. Um, I the, uh... Let's go here. Here we go. You sold the material. Getting started this destruction. I did all of that, but it didn't, it didn't contain any more than the helpers PY mm -hmm, and, the, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and this. Okay, that's, that's perfect. That's all I got. Okay, that's perfect. Because you okay, this is the implementation. Mm -hmm. So but you all set. But you all set. You just need to you just need to go the try to solve the exercise. You all set. Everything is working, no? Yeah. Right. So what's your issue? Yes, yeah, so I could, I didn't have any of that information. Didn't, I didn't have any of this information. Ah, okay. Because you didn't, uh, you maybe did not load the wave. Did you load the wave module? No, still missing. By the way, do, yeah, you do the same. You upload the classes file here, load it, and import that. The wave? Uh, no, classes. You, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Load like this one. Mm hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why it's throwing an error, uh, self not defined, but it's correct. 
itself about frequency as a parameter? For yeah. This is maybe an understand, uh, indent problem. Indent problem? Yeah, maybe. Ah, no, you miss off. The first argument of a function is self. So for this reason, he's saying that you miss self. That's all. OK, time's up. This is what you find on the solution PI5, okay? This is just an example of solution, okay? Do not consider that there are no other solution ever. You basically have to split the wave from signal, then define a class that is called, for example, a wave that takes three different parameters, Y, S, T, S, and frame rate. Frame rate is not mandatory because we just set up in fixed way. Um, so what you really need to do is Y, S, and T, S. Then define again, for example, a method for playing, okay, I'm playing the sound itself. Uh, that call is going to call uh, another function defined in the Alpers module, like the create audio, the method plot, because you're plotting the wave, you are not plotting the signal. So it's maybe much more better to put the plot method not in the signal, but in the wave. And then the implementation of the signal itself is pretty similar, aside from adding these other parameters, which is the function, which is the periodic function. Everything is basically the, basically the same. Let me see, let me see, let me see. Okay, so the create wave samples, the, sorry, the create wave method, instead of returning the, directly the array, it returns an instance of the wave, where the wave is class that you should have declared first. Is the solution clear? I'll take it as a yes. Okay, good. Oh, good. Oh, sorry. So let's get back. Okay. Instead of using your own implementation of the wave and the signals, you can just load the classes module, okay, that you already uploaded to the Jupyter notebook, okay, and you can obviously import from classes, import signal and wave. And you can use my implementation of the object itself. Okay, the main point here is, um, okay, you needed to change the implementation of the signal class in order to add another parameter to the constructor. But this is not correct. Suppose that code comes from your colleague or comes from some legacy framework. You can change that code itself in order to add another attribute that someone just mislead or you're not happy with or probably you just forgot. So we need to find another way to, let's say, augmenting the power of the definition, of the declaration of the objects itself. And for this reason, object-oriented programming has a really an elegant way for solving this kind of issue, which is called inheritance. Inheritance means basically, let's start from a base class, okay? Let's drive a new class that inherits everything from the base class, okay? As well, attributes, method as well. And we need to customize in terms of, for example, adding other attributes or other methods to this new derived class. So if you are not happy with the implementation of the signal because I just forgot to add the periodic function, you can obviously change it, but this is wrong because this could be somehow related to some legacy framework or you can extend the signal based class in order to define a new version of the signal class. Let's do this way. So um, let's consider for example the scene waveform, okay? So instead of considering the cosine waveform, let's consider the scene waveform. So I define, for example, a new class here that is called scene based. Ah, oh, just let me see. Yeah. Scene waveform based signal, okay? That inherits from signal, okay? 
and it defines a new attribute that is called, for example, a function, okay, which is the MP sin. Okay, what we did? We basically define a new class that is called sin waveform based signal, okay, that inherits from signal. So it inherits everything from signal, attributes and methods, and define a new attribute that is called hand way sin. Oh, in order to make this work, you need to import MP. So import numpy as MP. Okay, so you can obviously create an instance of this object, okay, like this way. And now you got obviously the scene for waveform based signal. And you can call obviously all the methods defined in signal, like for example, the print period method, print period, okay? We didn't define the print period inside this class, but since we are in reading everything from signal, we still are going to use the print period defined in the parent class, which is the, just prints the period, the inverse of the frequency, the frequency itself. Um, this is very important behavior, um, because you, what you probably are going to do now is that you are delegating to somewhere else, to someone else, okay? the scope, the, the task of printing the period itself. In fact, what we can say is basically that you, when you inherit something from a base class, which is signal right now, you're delegating everything, every responsibility to that class, if not explicitly, uh, obviously defined inside the new definition of the class. Um, the main problem with this implementation is that if you look at the create wave samples provided in my library, the periodic function is the MP cos. Cos and sin are similar, but not are unequal. Cos and sin are just offset based on 90 degrees. Um, so we need to, we are not very happy with the default implementation of the create wave samples provided by the common library. And in general, we are not happy with the create wave method provided by the signal. Okay, because in the create wave method, we didn't pass the periodic function as well. We just used the default one. So what we need to do is overwrite the method, define it again, keeping equal the same name. Because we don't want to break the code because someone changed the name of the method of the parent class. We still are going to use the method of the parent class, but we are going to use our personal version of it. So we need to define again the create wave method. So if I go over here, you define create wave, okay? First argument is obviously self, okay? Why yes, the yes equals create wave samples, okay? And so the signature sh obviously needs to be the same of the previous one and the, let me see just one thing, uh, this one, okay? This was original implementation. What we need to add, obviously, is another parameter here that is the function as well. Function. Okay. So if I, okay, execute this code, instead of calling the print period, I call, for example, the plot method. Okay. Uh, sorry, 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 plot. Oh, sorry. I call the create wave method. Okay. And then the plot wave. But let me see the other no attributes. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, as you know, he's complaining about the fact that he cannot find the frequency, because frequency is an attribute, an attribute defined in the parent class. But we are not creating an instance of the parent class. We are creating an instance of the derived class. So we still need to explain Python, how to set up, our basic attributes, frequency, amplitude, and offset. So what we need to do is obviously define a new, a new constructor method. Okay, self, okay. And let's use this syntax, arcs and quarks. Okay, and then let's do this one. Sorry. Oops. 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 Uh, b -b 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 
Let me see. Let me see. Um, sorry? Oh, sorry, I didn't get it. No, sorry. I Underscore? No, uh, one, yeah, sorry, one moment. Just one moment. Uh, super in it. Uh, Ah, sorry. <laughs> okay, no, it's not the issue. Mm -hmm. Ah, sorry, I commit an error. The field is called frac. It's not called frequency. Yeah, exactly. And this one is called amp. Okay. Let me see this error. Okay. Um, um, periodic function. Yeah. Should be correct. Flat in MPI function. Ah, okay. Periodic function wallet. Okay. Oops. Okay. NumPy has no plot, obviously. Because the create wave should not return this one, but should return a wave. PS, YS. Yeah. Frame rate. Frame rate. Okay, that's perfect. So if you plot now. Okay. Um, okay. So we did the. We basically define a new constructor. Thanks for the suggestion. I didn't say it. What we call the super. Super is a very important keyword in Python because it's saying, okay, call some method, okay, in the parent class. So call the constructor method in the signal class and provide all the arguments that could be being passed. For example, when you declare a scene waveform based signal. So if I provide, for example, amplitude and frequency here, all these parameters get, get passed to the constructor, the parent class, since I call the super.init method. And obviously, the create wave implementation is this one. It is basically the same as before, but the main difference is that you need to pass the you need to pass the periodic function as well as last parameters because the uh, default implementation of the Alpers library does not accept a periodic function. Okay, or it provides a default periodic function that is different from our one. So there's an issue. I committed another error because this one is YSTS. Uh, let me see. Okay, no, now it's good, now it's fine. So this is a plot. So what we've seen so far is basically you are going to, let's say, delegate some behavior to the parent class, like we did in the constructor, and we were not happy with the default implementation provided by the parent class about the create wave, for example. So what we did is implementing them again, okay, providing the, our personalized, customized version of the create wave sample scrolling method. Um, but uh, there is actually another way you can use to increase, let's say, the model, the complexity of your object, okay? We use this one, which is basically is, okay, inherit everything from a parent class. But there is some cases where this approach cannot work. But you can use another approach provided by, by the object-oriented programming, which is called the composition. So you are going to compose the final class
with pieces coming from other classes. So think about it. A sine waveform based signal is a signal. So that's okay in everything, everything from the signal itself because, because we, can't, we can't probably uh, reuse the print period. Period is always the same, sine, cosine, it's a difference. But the main issue here is that if we can set up, for example, the waveform, the scene waveform, so setting up a different waveform for the wave, that attribute um, is uh, some sort of a feature, okay? So the waveform is a feature of a signal. So the scene waveform is a signal, but it has, obviously, a waveform. So what we can do now, we can compose this function in a different way. If you notice here, I define a function mpsyn. mpsyn is another object. It's just an instance of something that someone created for us, NumPy in this case. So we are composing this scene waveform based signal in a reads everything from signal because they belong to the same family, but at the same time, we define, we compose this class using another attribute that is the same, that is the same waveform. So from one side, it obviously inherits something from someone, okay, because it responds to the verb is, the verb be, and from the other side, it can be composed by something else because it responds to the verb have. This is a very, uh, let's say, this is a trick that I typically use in order to understand the difference between delegation, delegation to the composition. At this point, you can obviously, um, let's say, um, think about inheriting from multiple classes. So suppose that your object, your final object, like the scene waveform based signal, uh, belongs to multiple families. This is not the case, but just suppose it. It would be good, okay. Um, but there is an issue. There is an issue with this kind of implementation. Think about the print period. We know that when we call the print period over the scene waveform based signal, okay, Python looks the, that name inside this class, he didn't find it, and then looks in the parent class. But if you have the multiple inheritance and both classes implement the print period, which is the version that Python will call? Oh, obviously, there is a rule, okay? So Python will, um, won't pick up it randomly, okay? There is a rule. But this is a big issue because if you not remember this rule, you maybe can delegate to a parent class that this is not exactly what exactly we're expecting to call. So in general, the multiple inheritance in other programming languages is just forbidden, okay? So the compiler won't work, like Java, for example, for this reason. This problem is called the diamond problem. So you got basically two vertex of triangle, okay? The main vertex is the, uh, let's say, the upper vertex is, is maybe the, the final class, and the other vertex are the implementation, the existing implementation. So Python won't know exactly how the method you want to call. It tries to call the first one. The first one that tries, it's good for him. But this is probably not the best implementation ever. Um, in actually, multi, in multiple inheritance works pretty well for solving other issues, okay? For example, if you use Django, Django framework is full of mixin. A mixin is a class that has some custom behavior, okay? And this behavior, has not any parental relationship within the final class. So suppose to have, for example, a function, uh, suppose to have, for example, a class that is a mixin that help us to scale the wave, reduce the amplitude of the wave. Okay, there is no relationship within this class and the wave itself, this class or the signal itself. But it can offer you some APIs to do the job. Let's see an example. Let's go here. Let's create, for example, a, oh, sorry. Okay, let's create, for example, a, another class that is called scale by two mix in. Okay? Okay, uh, this class defines a method that is 
called scale. Okay, first argument is obviously self. Uh, okay, and it returns basically self dot ys. Yeah. Uh, okay, sorry. Okay. So let's define a class that is called scale by sum x n. It defines a method that is called scale, which takes the array of the samples and just divides them by two. So it scales down the amplitude of the wave itself. So if we define, for example, a new version of the wave, let's call it augmented wave, augmented wave, the thinner is from wave, okay? What we can do is that it obviously, that's the following method that is called scale, okay? And it returns super dot scale self dot ys. Okay, so we extended the wave, our wave implementation with a new class. Define a new method, a new API, generic API that is, that is called scale, that in turns, it calls something like the scale. In order to make this super works, we need to extend the augmented wave with the scale by two mixing. So what we can do is that basically go over here and add this class, okay? And now we need to define again the signal class. Let me see. Bah, 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 bah. Uh, let's call, for example, new signal. Okay. Oh, sorry. Def create wave. Okay. Let's take the implementation from here. Okay. But instead of returning the wave, it returns the augmented wave. Okay. So what you can do is this one. You create a signal, okay? You call the method create wave. It returns the wave. And you can call the wave.scale method, okay? Wave dot, uh, so, well, yes, okay. Is this one, wave dot plot. Uh, bu 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 yes. uh, yeah, sure. This one. Oh, it's basically the same. Just one moment. Okay. Signal. Okay. Um. It's a function, and there's one. Perfect. So let's look at the code. We define a scale by two big scene, which offer an API that is capable of scaling something. Okay, it's doing something. This is not very relevant now. We define a new version of the wave, okay, that is called augmented wave, but we in reads, let's say, from two different classes. But the main problem, the main issue, or the main difference is scaled by two mixing is not related by any parental relation with the wave or the augmented wave. Which is, we just added this mixing in order to add some custom behavior to the augmented wave. We then define an API that is called scale, that in turn is called the scale by two mixing scale method. We then define a new signal that in turn uh, is not going to call the signal Okay, it's not in reads from the signal, but in reads from the scene waveform based signal that we just augmented with new feature like defining the periodic function. And then we define again the create wave, okay, returning this time an instance of augmented wave, obviously, of this one. And then you create a signal here, and then you call the scale, and then you call the plot, and you get all the things. So the thing that I wanna notice is that the um, inner returns is transitive. So new signal inherits from scene waveform based signal that inherits from signal. So you are going to, let's say, 
make an object much, much more complex until the, your complexity of the world evolves, so you want to try to explain uh, better to the computer itself, defining these classes, okay? And you're still inheriting everything from all the ancestors. So what you have here is that basically you inherit from the scene wave waveform, but the method print period, for example, that does not be defined in this class, is defined in the signal, would be always available. So if I call, for example, this method, oh, sorry. Okay, so if I call the print period, obviously print period has not been defined in the same way base four, but it's defined in the signal. And that's fine, because the hierarchy, because inheritance is transitive. So Python looks for every ancestors until it finds the method we are going to call. Um, this concludes our second part about object-oriented programming. So let's try to recap just two different things. First of all is the diamond problem. Uh, in this case, the multiple inheritance works pretty well because there is no relationship between wave and scale to mix in. Because scale to mix in adds no relation at all with wave. So you can't have basically some sort of methods that have been called the same. So Python cannot be wrong about this. Uh, and we uh, obviously uh, saw that the using the multiple inheritance and stating that an object belongs to two different families can lead to the diamond problem. So Python doesn't know exactly what methods you are meant to call, okay, because there are multiple versions of the same method defined in the parent class. Uh, but a nice implement, a nice usage, for example, uh, multiple inheritance, it is mixing. that is very widely, widely, widely used in all the framework around the web in Python, for example, like Django. If you want in Django, for example, add the support for get request, post request, delete request, what you need to do is just adding to your controller, to your view, uh, mixing, different kind of mixing, delete mixing, update mixing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So even if the form is the same, I want to stress you out about this concept. Even if the form is the same, the meaning of wave and scale by to mix in inside the definition augmented wave is profoundly different. Because this one implies a relationship between them, parental relationship, while the scale to mix in has only the same syntax, but it expresses a very different concept. Questions? Okay. Second exercise, and then we have a pause. Okay, uh, so your exercise would be the two, number two. You need to write up dictionary serializer mixing, so a class that should implement a method that is called serialize, okay? That this in turn is going to print the amplitude, the phase and frequency of a signal as a dictionary. So take a dictionary, you need to compose it using this class. Then you need to extend the scene waveform based signal that you can find on the classes module to include a new method that call the mixing serialized method, like we did with scale. Uh, obviously you can import the scene waveform based signal from classes module. That's all. So if you have question, you ask me. Is the exercise clear now?
or just a number? And then mm, you from yeah, let's see. From yes. Uh, because this one, we need to specify the, the name of the, the period. Sorry, function. Okay, oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, period. Sorry, yeah. the layout is different. Equals. This one, this one. No. Problems, questions? Yeah. Tell me. Does it seem to. Did you load the, the class module? Yes. Let me see. Here. Yeah, you load it um, with I the percent load, load command. Here. Percent load command. Right here. And I was able to mm -hmm. okay. import signal. Okay. Away. Let me see the error okay. Oh, it's probably misspelled. Yeah, look, for, uh, yeah, yeah, just look for it. Yeah, there's no result. Yeah, sorry, I spotted another error. That class is not defined in the utils, so you need to maybe copy or just wait for me. I push the code down just now. You want to copy or I push the code? Yeah, I push the code. Classes. Okay.
okay, it's online. I push the scene waveform definition, okay, to the classes file. So you just need to download it again and load it again. Otherwise, you can copy from the code. Yeah. Yes, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This one. Uh, one moment. Okay. Solve the issue. You fix the you solve the exercise. Let me see. Just implemented it. Like yeah. Yeah. Per yeah. Perfect. But you need to define. You need to add a new API over here that is calling the serialize or the mixing. Oh, okay. okay. That's all. Yes, it's not mandatory, but uh, honestly, in my personal opinion is much more clear that you, need, you call basically add an API that is uh, not taking any kind of parameters and will call uh -huh. the serialized function that takes all the parameters. Because in this way, if you offer this one, serialized method would be available to the client, but client needs to know that he needs to provide you the AMP face and frac. MAMP face and frac are the state of the object, so you, you have it. Right, okay. So if you offer, an, this, you get the idea? Oh, by the way, this is opinable. Uh, this is not. This is my personal point. I typically prefer look than this. Oh, yeah, I yeah, the idea would be that you offer the user the simplest API ever. Okay, so if you require that user can type your uh, parameters, you make his life much more complex. If you offer an API that takes not parameter as well, okay, it's much more simpler. We got a pause in 10 minutes, no? Okay. We got a pause in 10 minutes. 10 and 30. Sorry. When you're walking around. Ah, yeah. Yeah. As you walk. Just one, one thing. On the web, there is another method, an Ether API that it can offer you the library I sent to you that is going to play the sound, okay? So if you can play, you should have something like this. If you press play here, you, you listen some sound.
You fix it? Did you solve the exercise? Ah, okay. Okay. Do the exercise. Tell me.
an hour uh, break till uh, getting a game. Okay, but I see the my personal solution of the of the of the exercise, and I want to add just a few different things. First of all, a definition of the dictionary serializer mixing is pretty easy. Okay, it implements a uh, an API that is called serialized that takes amplitude, frequency, and phase as arguments, and just return the serialization of the, as a dictionary of uh, those attributes. And then you define the class that extends our base signal, some function based signal, that offers you a custom API that is called serialized that takes no parameters, and it is capable to call the uh, serialized method of the mixing itself. So. This is not actually the only solution ever, because if you think about it, you can try to do not implement the serialized function inside the extended version of the signal. You can call directly the wave, the serialized function of the dictionary serialized mixing. But there is an issue using this approach. If you call directly this function itself without uh, implementing some sort of proxy, okay, over here, you need to provide all these parameters. But all these parameters are part of the state, the state of the object itself. So you don't need as a client to know that you need to provide this kind of parameters because it is inside the object itself. I was just saying that a general rule is offering client the much simpler API ever. So if you can avoid to provide parameters, it's always better and hide all the complexity of calling something with parameters inside under the hood. One more thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's a yeah, extended version of the signal. Yeah. Yeah, because this one is missing. Yeah, correct. I fix the code and push out the line. Oh, sorry. This is a live coding, so good up. Ah, that's a fine question. Um, I tried to, at the very beginning, oh, we, we got a break here, so feel free to leave, obviously. Um, at the very beginning, we talked about the difference between signal and wave, and we state that a class for modeling signals and a class for modeling wave. So you got a class for one single responsibility, basically, which is a very important principle of object-oriented programming. So I'm going to ask you, is the Dick Signalizer mixing needs to know the internal state of the object? In my opinion, no. Because the dictionary serializer mixing is just an helper class to provide a way to serialize something. And the thing is, they are just parameters. I could, I don't know, I could write here, instead of amp, freq, face, I could say, hey, bc. It's totally the same. Because the dictionary serializer object, in my mind, has no knowledge at all of signal or waves. It's just a new class that offers me a service, and the service is serialization. For this reason, there is no self hemp inside the dictionary serialized mixing. Otherwise, if you think, would be would be not a mixing anymore. Because there, there was, uh, in this case, there was uh, some sort of parental relationship between the signal and the dictionary mixing. But we say that mixing had nothing to do. They just had some behavior, some other function, some helpers, mod, helpers methods to solve a particular issue. Uh, other question? Yeah. Is a, sorry, I didn't get it. Yeah, yeah, they are the same. Yeah, they are, they are synonyms. Yeah. If you study telecommunication engineering, the right name is phase. It's not offset. But in order to be understood, offset is just the delay. But if you talk delay for telecommunication engineers, they probably won't understand. Okay, so talk with face. Yeah, obviously not. This is the most generalized one. I um, want to say one more thing. Okay. Um, 
a method like this is uh, somehow useless. You know, because it's basically you saying that constructor takes every kind of arguments, it wraps inside arcs and quarks, and calls the constructor method of the init class. So actually, you can remove it, okay? But they just make this a sample to explain the importance of the super, which calls a method that comes from some ancestors. It could be direct parent or another ancestor. That's all. So we have a bracket we see at 11. So um, there is a concept in Python that is called method resolution order, which basically states this thing. If you have a method that has been defined in two different two parent classes, okay, Python, uh, just look the first one. So you basically go over the first parent class, you look for the method, the method exists, okay, stop it. If the method doesn't exist, you go for the fourth parent class and you look at the other methods. If you look, if you find okay, if you're not fine, you get the method the not found exception that you basically are. Yeah, yes, the, uh, yes, the order of the parent classes, yeah, yeah. But in general, it's not very, well, at least in my personal experience, I do not ever feel this uh, wave of using the multiple in a written slack in this way. I always use mixin because, you know, there's probably there are some changes into the Python version, so they change the real law of resoluting methods, and this logic that you get used to, uh, let's say, to stick with is probably not applicable anymore. So if you update, if you update the Python, you'll find that some, some code, some piece of code doesn't work anymore because they just changed the method they resolved. So for this reason, for this reason, if you are going to use the multiple inheritance, you can use the composition. So instead of inheriting, extending everything from the parent class, you create a new class that is, as an attribute, that is an instance of another class. So you compose a new class. So think about the difference between composition and delegation. You are delegating if you inherit from, but you can compose at the same time. Java, for example, does not support, for exactly for this reason, the multiple inheritance. So in Java, you can inherit just one class. So Java has not concept of mixing, for example. Mixing in Java that can be implemented in other ways. Uh, we have a bracket. I cannot force to stay here. 11. Half an hour, actually, but we lost 10 minutes. Okay, so in this third part of this crash course, we're gonna see uh, something very relevant that is not very widely used in, com in, uh, in Python itself. If you came from other languages, you can find much more intense representation, much more intense usage. But in Python, it is uh, somehow relevant to introduce this concept because it can leave you some sort of, let's say, uh, another guideline, okay, to be used when you develop software using the object-oriented programming pattern. Let's start from the real world example. Uh, we played with the note piano, but note piano is very, you know, boring, okay? At some point you wanna transmit, for example, an audio transmission to somewhere else, okay, to someone else. But the, the channel, the wire of the air, is capable of adding so much noise, okay? And make the sound itself not being capable of understood when you reach the final destination. So what we typically do as engineers is implementing a modulation system. So a modulation system is just a system that is capable to add some sort of transformation to the original wave. And it basically has two different behaviors, one's for modulating and one's for demodulating. So you take the original wave, you modulate it, you get the modulated wave, and in order to 
um, let's say, listen to the modulated wave, you need to demodulate it away. So what we are trying to do now is defining this behavior. Okay, let's try to define, let's try to define a new class. Okay, this class is called modulator. Okay, and you have two different methods. Modulate and demodulate. Okay, first argument is always self. So first argument is the self, okay. and the second argument is the, is the oh, let's call it information wave. Information wave, okay. And in order to modulate, in order to apply this kind of transformation to the signal that you want to send, you need to have another wave, a wave that helps you out to apply this kind of transformation. This wave is called modulating wave. Modulating, oh, sorry, let's call it carrier wave. Okay, and the same applies for demodulate, which in turn takes the modulated wave as input and the carrier wave. Okay, wave, okay, pass, oops. Okay, so instead of implementing the methods now, uh, we are just defining the behavior. So we are just defining how this kind of modulation system will work from external point of view. We are not providing this now, the implementation of the modulation, because I did not say which exactly modulation type we are going to use to send the signal to your friend. So what we can do now is, instead of implementing something, we raise an error. Raise not implemented. Okay, you need to implement this method before calling. You'll understand everything in a while. Just stick with me. So if the user is going to use the modulator, he's going to get an error because he can't use directly the modulate and then the modulate were methods because they are not implemented actually. In order to enforce um, this kind of behavior of this strange class, we need to import something from the library of Python itself. From ABC, import abstract class method. Oh, abstract method, sorry. And we can add a decorator over here that this method is called abstract. Okay, what we define here is called in other language an interface or a contract. You're just saying that Man, a modulation system should implement, it should respect this signature, but you can call directly this class, so you can call, you can create the object, the instance of the modulator class and call the modulate and the modulate method, because we need to provide some kind of an implementation that could be different depending on the kind of modulation we're trying to work with, okay? So in order to enforce this at, uh, let's say, Python level, we added a decorator that comes from the ABC module. ABC stands for abstract base class. Instead of before, this class is abstract, so it does not provide an implementation. It cannot be used directly. You need to provide some sort of implementation first. And uh, we just uh, decorated all these two methods with this nice uh, decorator. Um, the simplest uh, modulation system ever is called the amplitude modulation. You probably, if you have an old car, you find EM modulation. Is the way that you can transform the original signal, um, let's say, uh, mapping the signal itself into variation of the amplitude. Okay. But there are other ways of modulating signal, like the frequency modulation, FM, or the phase modulation, PM. Uh, actually, AEM is the most simplest form of modulation because it requires very simple device in order to modulate and demodulate. While on the other side, FM is much more efficient in terms of spent power, in terms of, uh, let's say, resistance and resilience to the noise of the channel. It could be a wire, could be the air, etc., etc. But the amplitude modulation is the simplest form of modulation ever. Uh, obviously, we are talking about uh, modulation of analog signal, not the digital signal. Uh, because we're playing with, let's say, 
analog with old radio, okay? But you can apply all these things to digital signal, but obviously this is out of scope. So what we need to do now is implementing the amplitude modulator. So my amplitude modulator, amplitude modulator would be a class, okay, that extends the modulator, okay? And it defines two different way. It defines, sorry, the two different methods, okay? I need to remove this one because it's useless. I need to remove this one, this one, this one. Okay. The modulating method is very, very easy in amplitude modulation because it's just about a multiplication between the carrier wave and the signal wave. So what I can write is this one. Information wave, star, carrier wave. And the, the modulation is basically the same, but instead of considering the information wave, you consider the modulated wave. Good. Okay, so now let's import something from the helpers. Uh, helpers import, mm, let me see, create audio, okay. Create audio. <sighs> takes the, uh, takes a wave, so you can provide your own wave or you can provide a sample wave that I sent you. And if I run this code, okay, the creative deal is capable of, oh, just for one moment. Sorry. It's not the creative video, it's the get wave samples. Get wave samples, okay. Okay, good. So if you run this code, basically, you are going to use this function that is defined in the helpers function called get wave samples. You pass the audio wave you wanna read, and this is going to return you some data. You remember, well, this is the S, this is YS, this is the frame rate, okay? So frame rate is this one. Just a few words about the frame rate. We always played with a frame rate of 3,000, okay? But in general, for digital signal processing, in order to be able to reconstruct the signal after, after it has been digitalized, you need to work with the frequency, a frame rate that is at least double the frequency of the wave itself. So if you know that our voice stands from 20 hertz or 20 kilohertz, the frame rate is higher than the double. So that's the, this is a very typical value, okay? Because it's able to, let's say, handling all the voice, just all the voice. This would be maybe not sufficient for all the music. So for example, if you work with this frame rate with the music, you could lose, for example, some components in terms of frequency, and maybe you can sound your song in a different way. But for, for, uh, for voices, this frame rate is pretty good. So this function is able to read the wave and get the array of YS, the array of TS, as well as the, TS, uh, the, sorry, the frame rate. So uh, TS, YS, frame rate. Okay, this one, perfect. So we can create, for example, the wave, okay. TS, oh sorry, YS, TS frame rate, okay? So we just created the instance of our wave. Nothing complicated. Okay, so this is the, uh, our information wave. So information wave is this one. We need a carrier wave. Uh, a carrier wave is another wave. Carrier wave, okay. So let's start from signal. Let's consider, for example, a frequency of uh, uh, Let's put it, for example, uh, 100,000, 100, yeah, 100,000 hertz. Okay, that's good. Call the method create wave. Okay, so the carrier wave is another wave. Everything clear? Perfect. So now we are going to use our modulation system. So we create the instance of the amplitude modulator. Look, the amplitude modulator, not the modulator base abstract base class over here, eh? the implementation of the contract. And we can call, obviously, the modulate, okay? If you call, for example, the modulate, what do you get? You pass the information wave, 
and the carrier wave. And you execute this code. Good. You got this error. Unsupported operand for star wave dot wave. Well, the main issue is that how Python can know how exactly it will be able to multiplicate waves. You can expect that Python knows how to multiplicate floats, integers, maybe strings, I don't know, but not waves. Because there is no concept of wave multiplication. So we need to instruct Python to do this kind of operation. And in order to do this, what we need to do? We need to define another class. So the class we need to define is called, for example, let me put here. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's define, for example, a new class. Class way with mall. Okay, so this is a class that basically implements the multiplication logic that we see in a while. That obviously inherits from the wave because we know that this is still a wave. So we just need behavior, but we can change the original code. That's fine. And the method we are going to implement is called mall. Okay, solve. And the only parameter that takes these methods is the other wave. Okay. Let's look at this definition. We created a new class, inheriting from the wave, because we still know that the wave with mole is still a wave. We define a method that is stable with, uh, we starts with the uh, double underscore that is called mole, okay, that takes just one parameter, the other, which is basically the second factor in the multiplication. So the first factor is self, second one is the other. Good. If you notice well, mule starts with a double underscore, like the init, like the constructor method, which means that this method has been, can be called magic. They are reserved. They cannot be used for whatever task it is. Because Python, when you write a way with mole star, another way with mole, will execute this method. And thus, the multiplication will work magically. So the implementation is very easy. Because what we do is just returning a wave, an instance of itself. Okay. Um, where you have the self dot ys star dot other. Okay. This is ys, and so this self dot ts self dot frame rate. Okay. So, the new samples would be just the multiplication of the uh, left factor multiplication, ys, <laughs> and self other dot ys, sorry. Oh, this one is wrong, ys. The argument dot ys. So you take the, those array, you multiply them. Obviously, multiplication between array is not defined by Python. But if you are going, if we use NumPy, in NumPy, someone defined the operation of multiplication. So someone in NumPy has implemented the same way of multiplicating waves, by just under the hoods. So if you run this code, yeah, let me check, this is correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if you run this code, you get this one. Um, the main problem is that the let me see, just one moment. Yeah, the main problem is that the information wave is a wave instance. It's not a wave with mole instance. So we need to transform it. Oh, you could obviously change this signature in order to add the wave with mole instead of calling wave. But we are going to see another way. Let's go back to our implementation of wave with mole. Let's define a new method that is called, for example, convert. Okay. Convert. Self. Okay. But this time, instead of passing the instance as the first argument, we are going to pass another object, an object that is totally different, an object that is wave. Okay. So instead of passing the self, like we always do, we pass the wave, which is another object. So this method will return an instance of way with mall, with mall, okay, where you have the ys equals to wave ys, t 
TS wave TS and frame rate frame rate wave frame rate. Okay, so we're basically accepting an instance of type wave. An instance of type wave. Okay. And returning an instance of type with mode with this strange yeah. method that does not accept self as parameter, so distance. A method like this is called static. And in order to let Python know that this method behaves differently from other ones, we need to add another notation. Uh, sorry, another decorator. And the other decorator is the static method. Okay, if you execute this code, you got no errors. So we provide a static method that does not depend on the context of the object. This takes in place the only task of converting an incoming web instance to itself, to an instance of itself, basically. This is not very mandatory, you know, because we could have changed just the definition of rear, okay? The definition of rear, because we know that wave away with mole, aside from defining the mole period, the, the mole methods are basically the same, behaves basically the same. So if you can call the constructor passing the wave with mole, everything is gonna work. But in order to make you aware of the fact that there are other kinds of type of methods that Python supports, this is a static one. This is typically usage of a static methods. Convert something into other one. Because if you, look, if you think about it, the, uh, it's a static because it, it does not depend on the state of the object itself. It's some sort of an helper method that helps you just to map one thing to another one. So if you run the code, Okay, so we need to adapt obviously this code because now we need to call way with mole, okay. We call it the convert, okay. We pass the information wave, okay. And this is the information wave with mole, okay. Sorry for the name, okay. We do the same here. I oh, know, sorry, one moment. Let's see this object, just to see if it's correct. Okay, so this is an instance of main wave with mall. So we need to do the same with the carrier wave. Queen with mall equals this one, but instead of this one, this one. Okay. Okay. So if you run the modulation now. Uh, bu, 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 bu. You need to update this one with this one. Uh, they're different. Yeah, that's correct. Signal. Uh, bu, 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 bu. Ah, okay, because the duration. duration. Okay. Um, mm, mm, mm. Okay, sorry, huh? one moment. Duration. Now they got different shape. Mm -mm -mm. Let me see. Just one moment. I'm Create wave.
OK, that's fine. OK, um, we obviously need to have some constraints between the carrier wave and the information wave, so we can just create a carrier wave from scratch. We need to be sure that the duration is the same and also the frame rate is the same. Otherwise, the operation of multiplicating waves doesn't work because they got different sides in terms of values. So that was the issue. So if I execute this code, I got this one. OK, the obviously an instance of weight with more. So the modulate function is returning a weight with more. Modulated wave, OK. And if you modulated wave dot plot, OK. Fantastic. It's totally wrong. Uh, let me see just one moment. No, this is wrong. Duration. Yes, okay, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Yeah, just let me, just one moment. Sorry? No, it should be it should be okay this one. Uh, it should be T S and Y S. At least when I switched it online then I get a normal one. T S here? Yeah. No. You mean if we example the uh the part we just switched. I mean the original. Ah, okay, here. Information wave. Okay. Carrier wave. Simple wave arm. Carrier wave arm. No, now let's go. Um, okay, what's messing up with the, yeah, the constraint between the carrier wave and the uh, signal wave. So what you basically have to do, uh, you see, just look at this one, you see something that the amplitude, okay, is varying in according to the scene function. So it basically, the amplitude modulation shapes the information it needs to send in according to the carrier wave, which was a scene. And you see that basically here you get this something like that looks like a scene, obviously. It's not the scene, actually. So this was the uh, example. And if you plot this now, if you remember the uh, first, uh, first part of the introduction, I say that uh, time to time is better to look at the uh, wave in the frequency domain, not in the time domain. So if instead of calling the plot method, you call the plot full FFT methods, okay, you see basically this one, which is in this case is the spectrum, okay, of the modulated wave, the actually the full one. Okay, uh, if you want to demodulate it, okay, you can demodulate it wave, okay. So let me take this one. Amplitude. Modulator. Okay. And the, sorry. First function is the modulator. This one, carrier wave amp. Okay. 
plot. Okay, and there was the original, uh, the original signal. So uh, what is basically um, needs to be understood here is just as the part about signal processing, but the part about defining class. We start in defining an interface, a contract, a template, something that cannot be directly used because it's abstract, okay? And you can read it just because we decorated all the methods adding the abstract method decorator. So the user cannot use obviously this one, but is forced to implement the modulator abstract by class. Providing, for example, the amplitude modulator, which is just a way of modulating things. Obviously, the signature of the implementation should be the same, needs to be the same of the one defining the abstract class. And once you do this one, you can obviously play with the code and get this one. At the same point, we notice that we don't know how exactly to multiplicate waves together. Just for a moment. Uh, multiplicate them together. Queen, we defined a new instance of the way with mole with a cost static method capable of converting an existing wave to a way with mole method. And then after that, what we did to do is just uh, uh, instantiate in the object over here, call the modulator providing the converted version of the wave, converted version of the carrier wave, and then get back to using the demodulator. Please. Yeah, you can find it in the classes more in the classes module as well. Yeah, I just meant it's like uh, in our code, we're having to do the dot convert and then pass that. But we could do that in the modulate function. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. But in the co in the context of object oriented programming, you let's say you are not free to use functions that are not related to object. So this is the issue. So if you play with Java, you cannot define, for example, a function that are not dependent of objects or classes. Okay, so for this reason, we code it this way. But yes, you can code a function, a general function, in some sort of model that takes an object and converts it. But we saw in this implementation the client in the object oriented paradigm. This is the issue. So you can do whatever you want, but this is the, let's say, the right way to do with objects in the object oriented programming. So in Java, your solution won't work, for example, because Java is somehow pure. Off and on. Thank you. So the exercise. Other questions? OK. So part three of the exercise. OK. In the classes module, you find a filter class. A filter class is an interface. It's not a class, so you can't use it directly. What you need to do is implementing the high pass filtering, which is basically is a filter that is capable of cutting off all the components, okay, greater than a threshold. So if you get back, for example, to the spectrum, so you have the spectrum on the x-axis and the value of the power on the y-axis, an high pass filter removes part of the spectrum, okay, starting from a cutoff uh, frequency. So your first exercise would be look at the filter interface I defined in the classes and implement the high pass filtering method. Second part of the exercise it would be more complex, okay, it requires time. So I'm not expecting that you can fix it, you can solve it now, okay. But what you basically uh, have to do is uh, this one. I want to explain it. This one is the wave in the frequency domain, the original wave. So it's the signal that you want to send. Good. Once you modulate, you get this one, which is the same signal, but you got a really bad product of amplitude modulation, which is are called sidebands, replicas. You see, those are basically the same as this, but they are being scaled. Okay, this is a problem for just one issue because they consume so much power, 
okay, that we, you can try to, let's say, avoid when you're sending because you want to reduce the amount of power sent. So your implementation, okay, uh, and after you get back to the modulation, you should have something like this, which you should be something like the signal you sent at the very beginning. So the implementation, the task would be knowing this, implementing an amplitude modulation with low pass filtering. That overrides the demodulate, so you need to implement the modulator interface again, basically. But you are not happy with the demodulation method that I provided to you. Uh, so you need to override that method, okay, in the amplitude modulator, in the, not the UDs, but in the class, okay. The new implementation should remove the side bands, so the bands that are laterally, okay. And this modulated wave, okay, mm, sorry, these side bands are totally useless when the wave reaches the destination. Talking in code. Did you understand the domain problem? Or oh, I'm gonna repeat it. I take a yes. But by the way, if you do not understand the domain problem, I try to rephrase it again. Talking in code, you need to call the original, the modulate method of the existing amplitude modulator. But you need to add something. You need to add the filter part. And in order to add the filter part, you need to, first of all, convert the wave to the spectrum. At the very beginning, we saw that you got a wave in time domain you can get, using some custom function, uh, the spectrum, which is the same wave, but in the frequency domain. So instead of considering the independent variable as the t, is the x. Once you compute the spectrum, okay, you can define, uh, uh, sorry, this instance of the spectrum, after you call this method, basically are these fields, which is very similar to the wave one, hs, fs, and frame rate. And when you do this, so when you call the, when you have the spectrum, you can import the low pass filter. This has been already implemented to you. That implements the filter. Call the make wave after filtering has been applied. And then you should get the original representation of the wave. So first part is very easy. Take the filter interface defining the classes file and implement a version of high pass filtering. Okay? Oh, obviously, in the helpers file, you find the iPass function. So you cannot just write it. Okay, you need just to import it. It's very, should be easy. Second part is, them, is uh, not very easy because you need to understand the domain problem first and then apply it later. Oh, by the way, I'm here to the conference, so if you want to solve it, we can obviously discuss maybe later. But as always, you find the implementation inside the uh, solutions file. Okay, you got... Uh, 13 minutes. So be focused on the first part of the exercise. The second part we can discuss maybe later if the domain issue, the domain problem is not clear. Yeah.
clear first before getting to code. Yeah. What is? In the classes, classes module. From classes, import filter. Thank you. look at the solution file, what you find basically is that the abstract based class for filtering spectrum has been defined. It is called filter. Okay? It has just one method, marked as abstract method, so you can't call it. It accepts AH, FS, cutoff, and factor. Uh, that are the main components of the spectrum basically. And the implementation is obviously empty. It raises an error. An example of filtering is the low pass filter. Low pass filter removes frequency uh, down the cutoff, okay? While the high pass removes frequency above the cutoff. So the implementation of the high pass filter would be pretty easy. It's just changing all this way to call the high pass function over here instead of low pass. But what I wanna be sure you understood is the the meaning of interfaces and templates or contracts, call whatever you want, abstract classes, okay? So you got this class that works at a template. So you force the user, you force the client to implement it using exactly the same methods defined. You wanna know because why this is very cool solution in object-oriented programming? Because you got, for example, Two different, inter two different classes that implement the same interface, like high pass filtering and low pass filtering. They both implement the filter interface. You can obviously be sure that your code will work if you are thinking in terms of interfaces, not in terms of concrete classes. Because they got the same shape, but they behave differently under the hood. You got this idea? Okay, for the second part, if you, I repeat, if you wanna solve it, you need to be sure you understand the domain problem first, and then talking about the code. So if you wanna have some doubts, we can obviously discuss maybe privately. I just, I didn't, I know that this uh, issue was, uh, this, sorry, this problem was uh, a bit more complex. Okay, um, so this leads us to the um, final part of our, uh, of our crash course in object-oriented programming. There is one more thing that you need to know to getting start with object-oriented programming. is the concept of design patterns. Design patterns are solutions to recurrent problems, which means that when you play with object-oriented programming, you have grasped that it's all about defining class, establishing a relation between them, override methods, call super method, whatever you can't reinvent the wheel in order to solve something. So there are these stand, standardized solutions that help you work with object-oriented programming in a very standard way. I wanna stress you out about the fact that it would be maybe much easier to reinvent the wheel all again in order to play with objects. But this probably there is a design pattern that have been designed and proved to be correct, proved to be scalable, proved to be uh, 
very interesting, very smart, okay, for solving your own issue. We're going to see an example now. Design patterns are typically divided into three main categories. Design patterns creational, that deals with creation of object. If you remember well, at the very beginning, we define a constructor with four different methods. Oh, sorry, four different parameters. Amplitude, phase, frequency, periodic function. But it's a very, I don't like that much, that kind of implementation. Because if your model obviously evolves and evolves and evolves, you can end up obviously adding more elements of the constructor signature, as well as obviously implementing class that inherits from the previous implementation. That's fine. But there are some design patterns that we play with objects in order to make, to make the list of parameters not fixed at all and be ready to evolve. So we reinvented the wheel, defining four different parameters in the constructor, but we didn't know nothing about design patterns. Behavioral pattern deals with how object behaves from the outside. So suppose you want to hide some business logic, okay? Okay, like the one we did, for example, the serialize. You did not want to force users to provide you the amplitude, the frequency, and the offset when you call the serialize method because you hide the business logic inside the class itself. So behavioral design patterns respond to this problem they establish some ways to wrap, okay, the behavior inside, some, let's say, a series of the class in order to change how they appear at outside. And last category, structural design pattern. You got, for example, a um, different list of uh, algorithms that always belong to the same family. Consider the modulation. The modulation is family of algorithms, okay? But you have amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, phase modulation. Structural patterns deals with defining way to try to uh, find out some solution to wrap up all these things inside a common container, let's put it this way, and helps the client define which algorithm should be used without letting me know how the algorithm itself will work. We are going to see one of this, one of the one of the area of the same patterns. And the, uh, let's say, the one that we are going to see is called the iterator. Iterator probably sounds familiar to you because Python offer it natively. But the, we're going to see the orthodox implementation of the iterator using design patterns. And we are going to see how Python implements it. Before seeing how to implement the iterator design pattern, let me say what exactly an iterator is. Suppose you have a collection. So you have something that could be iterated, okay? So something that is by definition iterable, like a list, like a graph, like a chart, like a, like a tree, for example. Do not think just list. List is very simple data structure. Think about um, tree or graphs, okay? So, you want to wrap the logic of traversing this iterable inside the object and offer the final user just the way to traverse this object. So you can find an object that can help you traverse, for example, the list from beginning to end, but you can have another object that can help you to traverse the list from end to begin. Or another one that goes for the first to the last, to the second, to the second last, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's good. So you want to hide this kind of complexity, okay, and let the user just choose the way you want, uh, he wants to traverse the list itself of the chart, the graph itself. So what we are going to do, what we are going, sorry, what we are going to need basically are two different classes. An iterator, okay, this is the interface of this object, and the iterable, which is the interface that makes an object iterable. So an object that can be looped through. So let's define this one, for example, the iterator. Okay, that's good. And let's define, for example, the iterable. Iterable. Okay. We should know that basically they are abstract classes, so they're gonna be treated like abstract, okay? So if you think about it, what exactly an iterator is going to work? 
you should support two different methods. A method for getting the next element of the collection and a method to check if the collection has been completed loop. Okay, if I've been uh, looped completely. So define, for example, a method that is called next, okay? And a method that is called as next, as next. Okay, those methods are obviously abstract, good. And this one is abstract, okay. This rise uh, not implemented data, we know. Okay, and this one, good. So let's start from an implementation of iterator. Let's consider the most simplest iterator ever, an iterator that goes, that traverses this object from beginning to end. So let's call, for example, a sequential iterator. Okay, that implements the iterator. Okay, it has the same signature as well. Okay. Ah, good. Okay. So the first thing is we need an object to be iterated. So let's define, for example, a collection. Okay. And let's put up some known for now. Define, for example, a init constructor, so a constructor cell collection, okay. Cell dot collection was collection. Good. We can remove this one. Perfect. So the method next should be able, when called, to return the next element of the iteration. Okay. So what it's going to do is I define an index, for example, I index set up to zero and check. Uh, re, sorry, element equals to self, self dot collection ee, okay? E plus one, return element. So the implementation of the Okay, so the implementation of the next method will be pretty easy. Okay, it's looking for the uh, hit element of the collection, um, the, the collection iterable, okay, increment the E and return the element itself. So the first time this method will be called, it's on the first element, second time you return the second element, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But still we need to implement some sort of method to check if the collection has been completely iterated in order to not rise here an index error because otherwise if we provide uh, an, an index that is bigger than the length of the collection itself, it will fail, obviously. So the implementation of the as next would be something like return E is less than length the self collection. collection. Uh, sorry, self dot E. Okay, does it sound for me, does it sound correct to you? Okay, that's perfect. From the other side, the iterable class, mm, it's very generic, okay. Uh, it's just saying that, okay, this class has this kind of strange behavior, it can be iterated, but it can add no more methods, no action, nothing. So we could define, for example, our signal. Okay, so let's start from signal. Let's call the create wave. Good. Wave. Perfect. Um, we need to state somehow that the wave is iterable. So what we do? Well, we do the same. We define a new class, iterable wave, that extends from iterable, okay? So we define a new class that is called iterable wave. Inner is from wave. It does the iterable, which is basically just now a placeholder. Okay, they say that, hey man, this iterable wave is iterable, so you can iterate through. But the definition is basically empty, okay? It has no method as well. And from the other side, we can define, obviously, a sequential iterator. Okay. Okay. So, 
Suppose now you create the, okay, let's do this way. Iterable wave. Oh. Okay, just creating an instance of iterable wave from the wave. Perfect. Once you got the iterable wave, you can create an instance of the sequential iterator. Okay, that's here. And the instant and the constructor of the sequential iterator gets called with a collection. So something that is iterable. In order to do this, we are going to pass, for example, the Y samples. Okay? Good, sequential iterator. Okay, so now when you have this object, you can start iterating things. So you can start iterate each value inside the array of samples in the way. So what we can do is uh, we need to write some code, some, let's say didactic code, some school code. Okay, let's write. So while sequential iterator, iterate as next, sequential iterator dot next. So we check until the sequential iterator as next element and we know that as next element check if the iterable collection has been looked through completely. And if we found it, obviously, we can call the next method in order to get the next element of the iterator. So if we run this code, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Oh, I forgot it. Yeah, one, one moment, let me see the code. I'm just restarting everything. So, uh, let's load the game. Okay, load classes. Okay, this one, scrap the mixing. Okay. Yeah, sure. Correct. This one. Uh, bu -bu 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 yes, done. Okay, in a way that it prints just the first element, 10 elements. So, is this code okay for you? But did you get the general idea of the iterator? Okay. Obviously, we define a sequential iterator because we wanna start from the first, second, third, blah, blah, blah. But you can define whatever logic you want in the sequential iterator. You just need to say to the user, hey, you wanna traverse from beginning to end? Good, use the sequential iterator. You wanna traverse an in reverse order? Okay, I will provide you a reverse iterator that obviously implements the same interface as the sequential iterator one, which is the iterator. This is pretty good. So this is the orthodox implementation of the iterator design pattern. But actually, Python is much more elegant and much more simpler than this. So we try to simplify all the things. Let's change this code. First of all, there is already a class, abstract class, that is called iterator. So we don't need to implement it. We don't need to define it. But we just need to import it. From collections.abc, import iterator. OK? And the same applies for iterable. So all these things are basically, oh, just one moment. Let's copy and paste this code here, okay. So this class is totally useless, okay? Because it just repeated. If you look at the implementation of the iterator now, 
inside the collection of BC is similar to mine. It's not equal. You're going to see why in a while. Uh, you can import, obviously, iterator, iterable as well. So your sequential iterator now uh, extends or implements the abstract base class provided by Python. At the same time, the iterable wave extends the iterable base classes provided by Python. So till now, if you execute this code, you see strange error. Can't instantiate abstract class with abstract method next. What is saying Python? He's saying, hey man, you are implementing the iterator abstract base class, but you are not defining a double double underscore next method. There is an interface, there is a template, there is a contract, it is Vinkland. So you need to, if you want to use the iterator, you need to implement this method. We implement it. So basically, it is the same. Instead of using next method, this one should be called next. Let's run the code again. Okay? It's equal, no? Perfect. Problem. We call the method here. The main problem is that method that starts with the double underscore we saw are called by Python under the hood. They are not meant to be public, so they cannot be used by the client itself. So if they are going not to use by the client itself, how can we print the next element of the collection? We can call this one. Well, Python does a very wonderful solution, which says for uh, no, just one moment. Let's go back to iterable. Let's see, no, 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 hello. For element in sequential iterator, print element. Is this syntax familiar to you? Good. It's much better than the while loop, no? Good. So let's see this code. Okay, in the sequential iterator. Um, what is the error? Index 10 is out of bounds. Because we forgot to add the as next check. So Python did from the first to the ninth element, and then it failed because there is no 10 elements. So oh, we don't know Python that he needs to call the as next method before checking and get and increasing, always increasing the, the element. We use a nice way of doing this stuff. Let's refactor the method next. Okay. You should be familiar with the try except logic. Except x. Yeah. Let's try this way. Let's try to get the element. If we catch this error, so if this one is not valid because it cannot index the array, we catch this error. What we do? We write another error. We write a stop iteration, which is another exception. Let's execute the code now. It worked. Because Python, when called this method, try to get the first one. It reached the ninth one, okay. Then at the tenth, it go to in the accept branch and erase the stop iteration. Python knows then when stop iteration is raised, the for loop should stop. This is the native implementation of the iterator design pattern defined before in the orthodox way using the while, the interfaces, the as next, the next method, et cetera, et cetera, in a much more elegant way. Python natively. This is Python natively. I want to just add um, a little notice about this one. Look, the implementation of this method is very different from the original one. This goes under the name that it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. Instead of checking if there is another element in the collection, let's bet that there is another element on the collection. 
And if not, let's catch the error and then handle the error itself, which is exactly the opposite if compared with this one. You check first if there is a next method, and then if this condition is true, you call the next method. This approach, this approach is very, very, very widely used in Python. On contrary, on other languages, you use the other one. But in Python, you will find that this approach rules. And this approach is very, very important to know. Remember, it's much easier to ask forgiveness, catch the error, instead of just putting an if, than asking for uh, permission. So if we refactor this one, the as next method is totally useless. So the code obviously works. Questions? Otherwise, I need one more thing. OK. One more thing. This variable has an underscore. This is not the case. This is not the case. I put an underscore because this variable, in my mind, is private. I want to offer this variable outside the sequential iterator. I don't want that the user knows this variable because this variable maps just the state of this object. It helps me just to track how exactly the looping operation has reached through. It's not meant to be public. This concept of keeping public information accessible to the client and private information not accessible to the client is very important in object-oriented programming and goes under the name and the concept of data hiding. You hide some data which is not necessary, mandatory, useful for the client itself, and you offer the user itself just the public part of the function itself. So remember this one. Obviously, there is no problem publishing, offering to the user the state of the sequential iterator, but Let's suppose that instead of having just a simple, a simple expression like this one, you got a very complex algorithm that applies some sort of bread depth first search on, tra on graphs of trees. Okay, this variable would be much, much more complex and maybe could reveal, could reveal the data inside your database. If you apply this method to the database, offering this information outside the class, making it public to the class itself, could expose you to a data leak. So think in mind about these things. If you remember well, at the beginning I said, if you know concept of object-oriented programming, you can translate them to somewhere else, like this one. You can translate the fact that you're hiding some data and an offering to the user a way to navigate this data, but the way has been defined by you and you only. Okay, questions? Yeah. Good. Yeah. No, don't think so. I think it's basically the same. Yeah. Okay. Now, can you can you rephrase? Sorry, I didn't understand. Oh, it's not self because uh, outside the function, self is, can be used. So since i has been defined outside the function itself, can be used, okay? I would have put basically on the constructor method, okay? I could have done self dot underscore i equals zero. But think about it. Is y, is y a parameter that the user, surely you know, why is the internal state? It's not correct that it takes part as constructor arguments because this is private. Because otherwise the user can say. So for this way, it has no self, but it takes part of the object, obviously. So it takes part of the object. It has no self because it outside of a function and that's all. If you want to use a self, you want to put in the constructor. But if you put in the constructor, you let the client define the way. 
define that variables. But this is wrong, because you don't want that client mess up with the state of the object. This is just yours. OK? Yeah. Uh, you, could do, you could do something like this, huh? Okay, propose you 10 minutes for the exercise. Uh, okay, um, like before, in this uh, part, the exercise can be split into two main different parts. Okay, the first part is, should, be, should be easy, while the second one requires some thinking about. So obviously, as always, we can discuss maybe later if, because you need to understand the domain problem first. Then code. First part is defining an iterator looping in reverse order. So instead of just letting the client looping in sequential order, you want to offer the client another type of iterator that implements the same interface that can help you out to, can help him out to loop in the reverse order. OK? The iterator is the abstract mix class. You can find it in the classes module. So you just need to implement it. Okay? Should be very easy, huh? Just changing the way you change the, the eye. That's clear, no? What well, the second part, if you're curious about this? Suppose that you want to offer a client a way to let him to say to you what kind of iterator should be used. Because now you're offering a sequential order iterator and a reverse iterator. But you want to offer a user a much more, let's say, human understandable API that is capable of, let's say, uh, saying you what exactly iterator you should be able to provide to him. So instead of letting the client use directly the sequential iterator or the reverse iterator, you want to offer a client an API that under the hoods compute the fact that the user wants the sequential one of the reverse one. And then you implement it. So you define an iterator creator interface. So an iter create, iterator creator abstract based class with a create iterator method that accept a string that say which kind of iterator should be requested by the user, sequential or reverse. You need to implement the interface because interface is abstract, so you can be used. And once you implement it, if the condition equals to sequential, then you need to return the sequential iterator. Otherwise, you return the reverse iterator. So you need to refactor the web sample collection class, which is basically our augmented version, augmented, let's say, uh, version of the web that takes in charge the role of the iterator that you can find on the classes module. You got eight minutes.
you decrease by one, 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 one until you reach zero. So the as next should be a little bit different. It should be easy. <coughs> So you should have understood that defining interfaces or defining these uh, abstract based classes is not a matter of, let's say, uh, uselessness, okay? It's very important to define this kind of interface because if you define this interface, you know at the client side that that code will work because that every implementation of that interface will respect exactly the same signature of the methods. So that's the idea of interfaces. That's the idea of abstract-based classes. Yeah. Back on the try step. Mm -hmm. So in Python, you would typically, if you were going to divide by zero, mm -hmm. you would just you got an error. Yes. You got a particular exception for your case that is called zero division error. So you catch exactly the exception and you know that if Python goes there, it's because it divided something by zero. Yeah, this is a very important pattern. It's better to ask forgiveness than permission. It's a, different, it's a different approach, it's a different approach. I can say you that Python is full of this pattern. Even if there are some cases where you can find maybe the other way around, much more comfortable way. Uh, just because the setting up an if, yep. setting up an if, which maybe, um, maybe gets your code much more explicit, okay? Because you see the if, okay? And you know that if that code enters into the if, because a condition is verified, correct? Yep. But but and if requires some sort of let's say a deviation from the main path so you need to adapt your brain to understand that hey there there is some sort of deviation using this pattern you do not have a deviation i, li I like to see this way i like to see this way but it's totally personal but i can assure you that this pattern is very widely used in python okay while the other way around is much used in java so it depends. So you bet on something, if something uh, is of a failure occurs, you catch the errors and you handle the errors. So let's wait. If you 99% sure that the condition can never be met, you use this pattern. Because your brain gets much more used to think about the normal flow. While on the other case, you can use the if condition. But again, it's a personal choice. Huh? The main problem is when you see a, a tree full of nested if, that was very bad. It was very bad. This could be a solution. Could be a solution. But honestly, there is a design patterns to fix the nested if condition. So you can think, if you play with objects, you can think about it. The main problem for Python, or at least for me, my personal opinion, is that Python cannot force you to use objects. So cannot force you to follow precise guidelines. So if you came from another world like Java, for example, you know that everything has been an object, so you need to stand with particular rules, okay? Oh, by the way, you should have understood that I, look, I like Java. <laughs> I think it's uh, a bit much trouble, but it's my, just my point. Okay, uh, let's try to see the solution. Okay. Okay, so the solution will be pretty easy. You define a class that is called reverse iterator that implements the iterator. 
position is the len or minus one, because minus one in Python is the last element, you would define again the next method. You decrement at each step the index, and you return. And then again, you, you catch the index error and write the stop iteration to make the for stop, stop, stop looping. Uh, you find, otherwise you find the iterator create interface which is the interface that you need to use in order to solve the second part of the exercise. Uh, let me say just one thing, and then we try, we're going to do the cap. Think the second part, for example. Define an iterator creator which return a create iterator. The iterator creator with a method create iterator returns, not the sequential iterator or reverse iterator, returns a class that implements the base class iterator. So you, sir, as need to write the same for loop, okay, because there are no breaking change in interface to be used. Because the sequential iterator, reverse iterators, implements the same interface. This is the power of contracts. This is the power of templates. This is the power of abstract base class. You cannot break the change if you are extending or implementing always the same. Okay, so say this. Uh, okay, so five minutes of wrapping up. This was a journey through the signal processing and object oriented programming. Obviously, my main focus was object oriented programming, but I found that signal processing is very interesting, but at least in my personal opinion, because we are overwhelmed. So if you want to understand something about this, this is a good choice. We started from scratch. We put everything in an object, but we noticed that there was an issue with the definition of the print, start, print, period method, okay, by the wave and by the signal, because you cannot call that method, okay, before creating the wave. There was an issue. Why? Because we just mixed up pieces of the same domain that was independent of each other. Then we try to augment our model, introducing the concept of delegation and composition. We just say that a scene wave based form signal is a signal, so it inherits from signal, and it delegates to the parent class. On the other, on the other side, the Scene wave based form signal was composed by a signal waveform. So it has an attribute that is a scene waveform. And thus, we underline the difference between delegating and componing as a way to increase the feature of existing object. You can change legacy code there. Step three, we're defining contracts. We define the modulator. We define the implementation of a modulator called the amplitude modulator. Contracts or templates or abstract base classes or Java interfaces. I typically call interface, but in Python there is no concept of interface. Step four, we're introducing the power of design patterns. There are a ton of them. We just saw the iterator design pattern. We saw it in the orthodox way, and we saw it how Python implements it. If you want to go deeper, on the website, there is a cheat sheet, okay, which is uh, some sort of collection of concept things, links. And if you're curious about this way, you can look, for example, how Python implement the decorator. That little, that little let that we put on top of the method, they are called Python decorators. Decor Python decorators are even inspired to the decorator design pattern. We didn't see, obviously. Decorator design pattern works for object, while decorator methods work for function. But the idea is the same. It comes from here, from object-oriented program. Guidelines find so far. Data encapsulation. You encapsulate data, and you try to separate public part from private part. You want to offer to the user just a public part. You are not going to offer the state. The, let's say, the helper function, private methods, okay. We notice that we can use the polymorphism. 
which in Greek means multiple faces, which means that you have an interface, you got different implementation of that interface. They have, let's say, the same aspects, but under the hood, they work very differently. But the client code will work the same because all the signature will be the same because they implement the same abstract big class. We talk about delegation and composition. We talk about an issue. A class should have a single responsibility. When we mixed up signal and waves, we got a method that won't work because we basically uh, were mixing up two different pieces of domain independent of each other. Obviously, you need to extend instead of modifying. You can change legacy code. And you need to depend on abstraction. Uh, this is uh, maybe harsh to be understood, but in general, you need to force your brain to think not in terms of concrete classes, but in terms of interfaces, in terms of much more abstract classes. Because if you do this way, when your client change the code, the client won't obviously notice any kind of difference, aside obviously from, implement, from uh, let's say, calling the right implementation of the same interface. So in general, you try to force yourself to depend on abstractions, not on concretization. Obviously, you can go further. First of all, think digital signal processing. This is a free book where I obviously uh, get inspired. This contains a lot of different things. We just scratched the surface of digital processing, obviously. Uh, over here, there are lots of really interesting things if you want to go deeper and understand much, much more things. We didn't talk about frequency modulation, uh, sig digital signal, power, amplitude, and so on. I did not detail anything about, for example, passing from wave to spectrum and applying some sort of algorithm. So, if you're curious about signal processing, go over here. And obviously, samples are in Python, so you should be totally capable of understanding everything. Solid principles are foundations for object-oriented programming. Solid stands for single responsibility principle, open-closed principle, which means can't change legacy code. You need to be open to extension, a close to modification. Least code principle that I can explain now. Interface segregation, define little interface instead of big one. The modulator, what exactly is the task of modulator? Modulate, then modulate, stop, nothing else. You should not add anything else. So instead of creating a really big, fatty interface, just define an interface that does one thing and compose your object with multiple interfaces. D stands for dependency abstraction, dependency inversion, but I cannot obviously talk to you because Python does not apply. UML, oh, we didn't see nothing about UML. UML stands for uh, Unified Model Language. It's a really nice way, standardized way to model things in computer science. So if you go from architecture to software, to object-oriented programming, to database, to deployment servers, so on, you could apply this logic. On the website, you find two UML diagram that helps you to see the relation between all the objects involved in the iterator and the, in the wave versus signal. I invite you to download the UML. If you have any doubts about the signature, the dashed line, et cetera, et cetera, you can talk to me. There are lots of design patterns. We just so scratch the surface seeing the iterator. I strongly suggest if you're curious enough to see the decorator and how Python implements the decorator pattern natively using the decorator method. There are a ton of them. We just uh, quote, for example, the creational design pattern in order to avoid setting up in the constructor 10,000 parameters, which could be somehow bad, okay? So creational patterns are probably the solution for solving that kind of issue. So if you wanna go look. Uh, above this, I need to say something. Each language implements the same design patterns in different way. So if you buy, for example, the most classic book ever, which is the book of design patterns designed with the gang of four, by the name of four brilliant people, all the examples are done in Java, okay? So you need to adapt your brain to transfer, to translate that, key, that concept inside Python itself. It could be different, like the next method with the double underscore, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, in the cheat sheet you find on the website, you find a site 
that contains all the design patterns defined that by this gang of four implemented in Python. And yeah, one more thing. I usually typically say to make a leg, think first, code later. And I try to stress you out about this thing. You need to understand the domain problem first, then code. I talk to you, for example, about the serialization issue. Think first, is the user, um, should be the user be aware of the fact that it needs to provide you amplitude, frequency, and offset, or that kind of variable should be somehow private and contained just in the state of the object? Think first, code later. These are very important things, and this applies especially for design pattern. I see a lot of experienced software developers or software engineers reinventing the wheel because they don't know design patterns. I strongly suggest you if you want to, let's say, uh, work with big projects or big team where you need to establish some sort of rules, you need to talk about design patterns. And you need to think first, find out what exactly is the solution, and then when you understand the problem, you code. Because code would be very easy if the solution in your mind is clear. And um, that's all. If you got any question, I'm here. I'm here at the conference, obviously. If you want to fill this feedback form, would be pretty welcome. Be honest, OK? I don't take anything as so fine. So if you dislike everything, that's totally no worry. No, absolutely no worry. If you, if you want to talk with me, I'm here. That's all. Thank you.